Hi, everyone, and welcome to A Seat at the Bar. I'm your host, Skylar Campbell. In today's episode, I had the pleasure of getting to chat with SCDC artists Patrick Yocum and Spencer Hack. Patrick is a principal dancer with the Boston Ballet and grew up in Souderton, Pennsylvania. He trained at the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater School and Boston Ballet School Training Program. After joining Boston Ballet 2 in 2009, he then entered the Corps de Ballet in 2011. Patrick's repertoire of classical and contemporary works is immense. He has danced many iconic leading male roles, such as Albrecht in Giselle, Prince Siegfried in Swan Lake, and Prince Desir in The Sleeping Beauty. He has also performed central roles in countless neoclassical and contemporary works, often originating roles in new works by innovative choreographers such as Yorma Ello and William Forsyth. Spencer Hack, my colleague, is a second soloist here in Toronto at the National Ballet of Canada. He was born in Toledo, Ohio and trained at Canada's National Ballet School. He joined NBOC as an apprentice in 2014 and then joined the Corps de Ballet in 2015. Spencer was awarded the Patron Award of Merit in 2017 and has danced roles ranging in so many varied styles. I've had the pleasure to witness some of Spencer's amazing moments on stage, such as his role as Alan in John Neumeyer's A Streetcar Named Desire and in ballets by Robert Benet, Alexander Ekman, Crystal Pite, William Forsyth, and Wayne McGregor, among many others. I wanted to speak to Patrick and Spencer today because I believe they both have such a unique sense of movement and innate ability to adapt quickly to interpreting choreographers' steps. I wanted to learn more about what that process is like and what their experience is like to be creative as a dancer. So much guys mm. for joining me here this afternoon it's really nice to see your faces yeah. and um so great to have you on the podcast um i want to start with patrick what were you doing or in the middle of rehearsing when boston ballet decided to shut down due to covid uh i love i love the story i saw the question yesterday and and I realized it is a really good story and I can't wait to tell, you know, grandchildren and people down the line, but it was actually opening night of, of a production. It was a Thursday. I think it was middle of March at some point. Uh, we were that night going to open a program that included Serenade. It was a triple bill. Uh-huh. And uh, that afternoon, actually that morning, um, I had found out that I was going to be put into the opening night cast as the waltz boy. I wasn't scheduled to. So I sort of had this wild dress rehearsal with a brand new partner. Oh, uh, dress God. rehearsal went okay. And uh, we were all ramped up to go for that night. And then yeah. as soon as dress rehearsal was over, everybody came on stage and said, go home, pack oh up your God. theater cases, get out. Wow. <laughs> uh, check so it was mail. right after the dress rehearsal. So you were able to do it. I did yeah. once and I was, I was very happy one. with how the dress rehearsal went. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was happy with how that went. So that's, that's all I could ask for. Okay. Yeah, we were in the middle of Romeo and Juliet and there was mm-hmm. a couple of casts that never got the chance to go on. So, and I'm sure a lot of companies were in that situation. Yeah. You know, in the they kind of, of and... it happened to me a little bit too, because I did, we were doing Romeo and Juliet and I was supposed to do Benvolio and I did the dress rehearsal and then in the first show I was doing another role and I hurt myself. And then we had two more shows the next day where I was supposed to do Benvolio. But because I hurt myself, I never got to do it. But I was happy with the dress rehearsal. So Yes, it was all I good. remember that. I I I did it with you. It was yeah, it was yeah. really good. Yeah. Yeah. It was perfect. Um so Patrick, you joined the Boston Ballet in twenty eleven and you've been a principal for three years now or four? Since since twenty seventeen, yeah. Okay. What? So, so yeah, three. What have you, what have been your biggest challenges along the way? And what was like the road to um, being a principal like for you? Um, I, I think I'm really lucky to have gone the whole process start to finish really in the same right. place. I joined Boston Ballet School when I was 19. Uh, I went up through almost all the levels to get to where I am. Uh, so I've had the chance to sort of grow in, in place and understand the rep of Boston Ballet and growth through that. So I haven't 
there haven't been too many major bumps in the road. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I think the most challenging thing I ever did, it was my first season, maybe my second season as a principal, I think. So yeah, it must have been 2018. Uh, there was a mini tour at the end of the spring season. It, it was the final week of of the season. And earlier that year, we had done a ballet called Obsidian Tear, one of mm -hmm. one of uh, Wayne McGregor's ballets. Uh, it's it's a cast of nine men, mm -hmm. and uh, the last week of the season, uh, it it was announced that um, the composer of the music would be performing it live with the New York Philharmonic in in Lincoln Center. So we were all ramped up to go and we were going to perform it just one night, one performance only in New York. But right before that happened, uh, our boss, Miko Neeson, and pulled me aside and said, with injuries and with the number of men in this cast, I need you to stay in Boston and do four shows of James in La Sylphide and three shows of the principal male in Chacon in four days, oh but no, no, five oh days, gosh. excuse me, five wow. days. Wow. So I had, I, while all of my friends went to New York for this fabulous one night only performance with the New York Philharmonic, I stayed in Boston and I, I. And you held down I the died. fort. I died, I died, oh <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Cause I was the only one that's, left. So yeah, was, that's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Some, so some big moments for you to kind of step up and, and kind of, I feel like at that point you would have proved yourself already to a certain degree before this. Like you felt like you were ready to do it, even though you were freaking exhausted probably at the time. Like, did you feel like you had enough experience prior to that? Like you, that you understood that you can take that on? I, uh, I don't think you ever know if you're ready until you're finished doing it. Right. Especially with a lot of, you know, every season something new is coming at you. You're going to be asked to do something you didn't know you could do before, something you didn't yeah, know you were yeah. capable of doing. Right. Uh, so I'm just lucky that I have been able to survive all the challenges up to this point, I guess. Yeah, it seems, well, Boston Ballet seems to fluctuate a lot too within the company, like a lot of people come and a lot of people leave within every season and, and you have stayed and, and been kind of like a rock and a and a, and a really like, um, you know, reliable, inspirational source of, um, I, I don't want, you're, you're just so, you're always present, you're always there and um, so beautiful to watch on stage. So I, I really, no. I really respect that in, in what you've contributed to that company in particular. Um, was there any single well, thank teacher you. that thank was you. influential of course. Was there any teacher that was like influential to you along the way that kind of kept um, you in check or, um, you know, always like, like a coach or a mentor that's there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. So thank you for saying that, by the way. That's very nice of you. I've been extraordinarily lucky, I think. I've been very, very lucky. Um, but no, I, I did have a teacher that I, I really owe a big debt of gratitude to, uh, he was my, one of my very first ballet teachers. His name was uh, George Thompson uh, in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania in the little town I grew mm -hmm. up in. So I was about 14 or 15 and I really hadn't gotten any professional training up to that point. And he had a little studio and he, I spent about three years learning from him and he taught me the work ethic that you need uh, to progress in this field because up until that point, I had been in theater. I'd been in musical theater, and that's really what I wanted to oh, do. Oh, I didn't know that. So, uh, but I, oh, I knew okay. I had to have some dance training along the course. Oh, yeah. So I didn't really start dancing until I was about 14 years old. So I, gotcha. because I wanted to be on Broadway or go do something, yeah. something along. It's never too late. On that line. You yeah. can still um, do but it. This is the one that convinced <laughs> me. No, no, no. You have potential. <laughs> it is never too late. You're right. You're right. Uh, no, I, I owe George, George a lot because... Uh, the, the big thing he taught me was the value of, of the work, the value of being confident in the work that you can do. And, um, and yeah, I'm proud of it, being proud of, of this career and what you can do with it. Yeah. Beautiful.
Spencer's been at the National Ballet for five six, years, six years, six years. Six six and years, you were recently yeah. you were recently promoted to soloist, second soloist. Was there any particular role that you um, that's not only been memorable but that's helped you develop and grow? Yeah, I mean, I think there's been you know there's so many roles like that, so mm -hmm. many memorable roles that have you know, I've been a joy to dance and um, mm -hmm. get to sink my teeth into, but also have taught me a great deal. But I think, um, I mean, I think the first time that I really got to be an individual in um, and, and, and sort of dance as myself was in Dreamers Ever Leave You by Rob Benet. And that mm -hmm. was, the, it was a new mm -hmm. creation and it was really exciting and um, up until that point, I, I feel like, you know, I had sort of, that was my, that was my third year in the company, my second year mm -hmm. in the core. And, and um, at that point, I was just sort of, you know, figuring my way out and getting settled and, you know, figuring out the ropes of being in a company. And this was the first time that I really felt like I, you know, really took ownership over my work and really sort of discovered, um, you know, how great that can be to, to be yeah. yourself and dance as yourself and, um, definitely, you know, well, I like what you said about individuality and yeah. I think you, both of you have such an innate sense of movement that is so beautiful to watch. And I, from what I know of the two of you, like your ability to adapt to different styles. So effort, um, so effortlessly is, is really, um, you can learn a lot from that. And you've had, you both have the privilege to work with many choreographers and great choreographers like John Neumeyer, Crystal Pipe, Bill Forsyth, Patrick in particular, Bill there at Austin. And so I'd love to hear from the both of you, is there a particular choreographer like Rob, um, you mentioned Spencer mm -hmm. kind of was there and um, gave you that kind of first opportunity to be yourself on stage, which yeah. doesn't always happen all the time. Mm -hmm. And what, so my question is, is there like a genre of dance or a specific choreographer that has like inspired you the most? I mean, this can be for, like I can, either of you can answer, like if, if there's anyone that comes to mind right off the top of your head, who would that be? Or what would that be? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, at a company like the National Ballet of Canada, and I think at Boston, too, it just seems like we do such a range of, of different kinds of work. And, you know, so I think there's something to take kind of from everyone a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think I just, I feel like most of the people that I have worked have been inspiring to me in, in yeah. many ways. So what you're and saying it, is like at, at any point, in the process of working with someone, you can take inspiration from them yeah. to a certain degree. Would you, so. would you agree with that, Patrick? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I will say for my, for my personal experience, I've had the, pr the pleasure, the privilege of working with Bill Forsyth for about nine, 10 years now. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, on a pretty oh, consistent wow. level. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I first met him in 2012, I think, so and we had been doing his ballets even before then so and I grew up watching um in the middle somewhat elevated and yeah and ballets like that and, and his work is so iconic and so easy to identify his theatricality is it mm -hmm. I have learned so much about being a performer from him mm -hmm. because and not only is he he's he's a fabulous guru in the fact that he's he's so well versed in all aspects of art he understands music to such a high degree. He, he's, he's brilliant uh, with his words. He's a virtuoso of words even more than he is of choreography. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a shame that people don't get to hear him talk more often because he, yeah, I, I, couldn't agree write, more. I, I yeah. write down his quotes all the time. Uh, oh yeah, I bet. Constantly, constantly, because he's always, he can talk about the same thing in so many, many different ways. And he's got yeah. It, he's got a great sense of humor and I yeah. could just gush about him all day but yeah. but mostly what I've learned from him I think is uh 
and, and this is the point that he always comes back to is that dancing is listening, is that dancing mm -hmm. is, is your ears. And the, what, it, what is interesting to an audience member, because he has been an audience member so much and he's, mm -hmm. he's lived a long time. He's in his seventies now and he's seen mm -hmm. so much in the world and, and he does museum work and he creates, he, he branches out to all different aspects of, of what dance can be. Uh, whether whether mm -hmm. it's the audience interaction or whether it's a dancer presenting something, uh, mm -hmm. so so what he always says is is they want to see you craft this, they want to mm -hmm. see you. They're not here to watch me necessarily. They're not necessarily here to see Bill Forsyth's work. They're here to. What's interesting is how you are listening to music, and make me listen to it in a new way. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I've learned what I've learned most yeah. from him but but yeah he's good he's endlessly quotable and yeah uh he's a fascinating guy Spencer with and with any particular work that comes to mind like uh that you've had to perform what was like the challenge from like the studio to the stage was there any um like process what's like the process you take in in that direction because I know pieces can feel like amazing in the studio yeah. and the minute you step on stage you're like oh my gosh yeah. I don't feel like a dancer anymore or, totally you know, like yeah the, the environment changes so what's that transition like Are yeah I mean particular piece that, like it's, that, is that? actually yeah and, and it's a foresight piece it was a um well this it, this experience I think kind of shifted how I thought about this um it was a approximate sonata that we did to when, when we did it in 2019, June 2019, mm -hmm. almost. And, and then we, we did it and on, then we just did it again yeah. recently. Yeah. We just did it in um, Washington. <laughs> um, yeah. but, uh, but that was really, um, really sort of changed my perspective about performing and um, process. And I really felt like, you know, this was the first time that I felt the performance was part of the creative process. It wasn't a product that we were trying mm. to put on stage and deliver accurately, you know, the same way every single time. And and this part of the the piece was to, you know, be in the moment and to respond to each other. And it was always different. We always made choices that were different. That wow. could make me and my partner on our toes. And it was great. And I think that sort of just sort of shifted my perspective a little bit. And I was like, well, this, this can be everything. Like I can do this for everything. You know, I can apply this, you know, to the Sleeping Beauty and to any other work that we do. And I can, you know, think of performance as a living, breathing, evolving, changing thing. And it's, it's not an end result. It's just sort of a, mm -hmm. a continuation of all the work that we've done. And now it's just the time to share it. So. So that was really um, kind of profound for me a little bit. I think up until yeah. that point, I had always been terrified to perform. And I was just sort of, you know, scared of the expectation of it and sort of how. Um, well, do you think you were, were, you were performing for other people and not for I yourself? Think so. Is that why? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I was you know, trying to please people, trying to yeah. do a good job and, um, and I kind of, it, it took me a while to get over that. And, and I think this piece in particular really helped me see performance as something creative, something um, that was, uh, I don't know, something that, that was just, uh, I, well, I guess what I really learned was that it was more exciting not to know how it was going to turn out and more satisfying for me than it was to go on stage and have, you know, a bunch of boxes to check and, and try and just check those boxes. I think I kind of, right. I realized that wasn't satisfying for me. I don't think it was interesting to watch. I think, yeah, you know, I, I, you I totally it to be agree real. with kind of looking at, yeah, you want it to be real. You want it to be living and breathing. I love, I love that you said that. And kind of, you're looking at the whole scope of the picture and yeah. not, you know, from beginning to end and every other, little, you know, the speed bumps along the way, yeah. just part of the process and to not be 
get fixated yeah. on those are is, is super difficult in our hypercritical career yeah. and, uh, uh, profession. Mm -hmm. I mean, choreographers explore ideas through like improvisation and like demanding dancers to pick up steps quickly. Others mm -hmm. like might demonstrate ideas more physically. Others rely on their like language or like speaking to you, gesturals infused with feeling and like we have to puzzle through all of this and we have to be mm -hmm. able to thrive in this like ever-changing creative environment is an ongoing practice for us. I mean for me I thrive in the studio when the choreographer kind of nurtures the dancer uh, input and ability to contribute. Mm -hmm. I think that's really um, important to foster that sort of uh, positive environment but I mean the process also becomes that much more enjoyable for me when the, he or she comes in with a plan. Yeah. And I think this is a perfect segue into our next topic that I wanted to kind of dive into with the both of you and get your, some of your thoughts, ideas on not only choreography, but, but creativity in general. Um, so I, either either of you can take the reins on this again. Like, what do you think it means to be creative as a dancer? Oh man! It's, yeah, that's a very tough question. It's, yeah, it's it's challenging. It's a, bit, it's a it, bit of a broad question, and I mean, yeah. we can distill it down later. Um, I I I have a study here that I because I was I was researching a lot about creativity in mm -hmm. performing arts and in visual art and in and um, still art. And um, I read this study, and I'll read it to you right now. It's a professor of psychology at Temple University, Robert Weisberg, and he published a dozens of papers surrounding the topic of creativity. And in his 2018 study called The Expertise View of Creativity Revealed that the presentation of a problem results in the retrieval of knowledge, therefore creativity, creative advances evolve out of attempts to apply the knowledge to a new situation. So with that being said, I believe dancers are inherently creative because we're always having to make these decisions, mm -hmm. um, decision making that require us to almost improv, even though we're being given steps, particular steps, we're having to make those connections to steps that we already know and then link those together. So we're always learning and performing movements like this. I mean, so, so that's a little bit of a like background research I've done on the topic. And I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts around, you know, like, have you ever wanted to explore choreography because of this? Or do you really like being told what to do? Or do you like that kind of ebb and flow inside the studio of like being able to, to have a voice? That's, that's very, it's an interesting study. I'd love to read the rest of that. That's that's yeah, I'll cite an interesting in topic. Uh, dancers so often are stuck into the rut, especially I think in big repertory companies of understanding, you know, this is what it is and you have to do it thus and so because for centuries, thus and so has been what yeah. people expect to see. Right, uh, yeah. The, what I really like to watch, and I think that's what distinguishes uh, professionals from students in a lot of ways mm. because professionals have been given enough tools mm. and have enough personal experience and artistic experience to take a vocabulary take a language that is sort of already set because in a lot mm -hmm. of ways especially very classical dancers are fair, are asked to do you know how many dozens of steps but in, in truth the the breadth of the vocabulary is not that big so mm -hmm. so it's kind of a what I like to see in in true uh truly great artists I think um they give them they give themselves permission to leave certain things out yeah mm -hmm. uh and part of the creative process is um especially for me is what do I want to emphasize what isn't so necessary and have a good balance between those two because it, especially when you're very young and you're very eager the, the I think the temptation is to uh, do everything to try and yeah, do everything more more <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah more more yeah. more uh, yeah and, more and, and more and, and try to and and you end up in this kind of prickly place of of walking on eggshells and being overly tense 
and right. you you um it's what young partners often struggle with i see is like mm -hmm. the girls want to control themselves so much and mm -hmm. especially if boys are inexperienced with partnering yeah. they they are uh, on top of the girl they're 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 so close because they're so scared of something going wrong but the the more you do it and the longer you do it you realize yeah. what you can leave out and mm -hmm. where space yeah. is given and to trust another person what do you think then yeah no i think i think it's that's really i agree exactly i think with what you're saying i think i really what i like to to watch and what i like to sort of strive for is um like a really clear intention and um mm -hmm and sort of the effort and the focus and the grit that it takes to go after that idea, but sort of being open to the react, like what happens in the moment, I guess, you know, or like sort of the, um, the more willing you are to go after that intention. I find that really captivating to watch and I find really sort of, I feel the most, I guess, creative when I'm in that state of mind. You know, I feel like, okay, this is what I'm going, this is what I'm trying to do. This is my, um, this is my intention. I want to do this. And then see sort of where that leads me by going after this idea and focusing on that, you know, seeing what, what happens. I think I was talking to Rob Benet about this and he said, I think he's heard this from Wayne McGregor um, that the, the, the ballet and like they're both choreographers, so they're talking about choreography, but the, the choreography that you see in your head is always sort of the worst version of it. And, and I think to me, again, sort of talking about, um, going back to what I was talking about earlier about performance and sort of thinking of it as a creative thing. I think that when I have a clear intention about you know what I'm trying to express artistically, then what the steps are kind of just lead me there, it's and and I'm not and I, and I don't have a clear picture of what it looks like. I guess it, it's more sort right. of about what I want it to feel like and what I want it to um, right. Yeah, and then what I want whoever's it to feel at like. the front of the room can steer you in that direction. Yeah. But if you you know not everyone approaches it like what you just said, Spencer. Yeah. I think no, no, no. Yeah. And I don't even know if what important. I said makes sense. <laughs> no, it does. And, and <laughs> well, it's just being super open and, and, and I guess confident enough with who you are as a dancer before yeah. you can kind of take that step. Yeah. What were you saying, Patrick? No, I was going to ask Spencer, I mean, to elaborate on what you said, do, do you have the habit of going back and watching what you did and seeing if uh, your intention express expressed itself visually in the way you thought it did is there yeah. often like a big you know a gap between those things um you know i don't often watch myself honestly like i, I don't um i have a hard time watching myself it kind of becomes counterproductive sometimes but um mm, but i think yeah, I like skylar as skylar as you were I saying I, I really try to rely on the people that i'm working with and um, mm. hopefully there's trust there that. Yeah, um, yeah I was just gonna say trust. Is you know, and I think I, I um, you know, the, the, the partners that I'm dancing with, the, the people who are rehearsing the ballet, I think, you know, I really, I place a lot of trust in them. And, and if I, if they're giving me a correction that I don't, you know, doesn't, that I don't understand or that doesn't, um, that I don't think leads me towards the intention that I have, hopefully there's a conversation about it. And then through that conversation, I understand why my choice wasn't the right one, you know, or why it doesn't come across what I thought. And, and um, you know, so I, I, again, I think, and this is hard, I think, for dancers too sometimes to, to, to speak what you're thinking and-, and um, Yeah, I definitely think having that voice um, within ourselves is, is, is a challenge at, at, some, at some points. Personally, for me, I think it took me a while to discover yeah. that um, because I was so caught up on just 
doing what people told me to do. Right, right. For so many yeah. years. I mean, that's because that's, that's how our training started. Totally, and, totally. But I, I've, um, I've learned, it's, I was going to say, I've learned so much just by talking to the people at the front of the room that I have, I think, like, as you were saying about Bill, you know, so much of what you've learned from him is, you know, the conversations you've had with him. And, and so I think talking about those ideas really helped me understand, okay, this is what I'm going after. Oh, okay, no, I had the wrong idea completely. And, and that I find helpful. Patrick, do, do you think mm-hmm. Bill is, um, like how, I know he's a super, he's very generous. Um, what was your experience like working with him? Or like, what is, um, what does he do to kind of unleash the best um, versions of all of the dancers in the room. He has he has so many tools at his disposal. It's it's um, it. What's it one is in sometimes particular terrifying. that you find that's reoccurring? Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think back to the latest creation. So, to, well, the last thing we danced was was in the middle, somewhat elevated. And uh, he's always in the process of changing things. He is, mm. nothing is ever set. I mean, there are certain things that are set. There are certain things that he knows people expect to see, uh, especially in that ballet, because it is, it's been done bazillions of times and, and it's kind of well known. But uh, the details are always changing. And if he has four casts, he'll have four versions. Which makes um, okay. ch- which makes changing casts sometimes kind of challenging, uh, <laughs> especially if right. he has a lot of time to work on stuff. He'll he'll just tweak and tweak and tweak up to the very last minute, uh, because as because he wants everybody to uh, express themselves in the way that makes them them look best, and in right. through the process he's watching you listen. He's encouraging you to listen more to discover a, a deeper truth about what. Um, how you interpret what he asks of you. And, and right. that goes triple for any time you're asked to improvise. <laughs> do you, He's, do you it, think the, the, the notion of improvisation kind of plays to like the, the spontaneity that he wants within the piece? Uh, ask the question again. I'm sorry, you had a little lag. Oh, I was just I was just asking about kind of um, him always changing it to the last second. Not big chunks, but little details. Do you think that's a way of making the piece look more spontaneous and exciting? And to keep our interest, I think to keep our right. keep ourselves interested, keep himself interested, uh, yeah. to never ex- never get comfortable, because yeah. the comfort. I mean, there's, there's a, it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. You can be very comfortable in something and you can grow to kind of dread it to kind of, right. Um, I, I, all you're, but, all you're looking down is the barrel of how tired you're going to be. Yeah. <laughs> so you can, you can sort of change your perspective and say, Oh, Oh, how can I, um, he's given me permission to do this tonight. Is that a mm-hmm. choice I'm going to make? Yeah. Right. And I think that's a, that's an interesting way to look at it. I mean, I I like when things are set. I also do, I enjoy both sides of it. I enjoy mm-hmm. something that's set and doesn't change, and therefore every night you can kind of a- approach the same steps, but you just feel better and better the more you do them, and you can get, mm-hmm. you know, you sink your teeth into them that much deeper every every time you have the chance to, to do it, that like repetition, um, but it's it's looking at the repetition in a different way not as like I'm doing the same steps you have to kind of look within yourself like I'm doing the same steps but then you have to ask yourself those questions rather than having you know Bill for example kind of impose them on you um or or if if the work is not uh sorry especially if the work is not you know emotionally driven you know if if the works are more abstract and you don't really have like a, a mindset to put yourself into yeah, you're you're totally right. That's a really cool, a, a very effective. And so you tool. had the chance to work with Crystal Pipe before she came and set um, her her new her new ballet on us this um, past season. What was that? You were there for a week. What was her mm-hmm. approach? 
I mean, okay, so we were there for yeah, a week and we basically worked on phrase material for that most of that week. Just sort of she taught us, she came in with these phrases already made and she taught. Right. So she came in uh, with material. Material, yeah. Uh -huh. And it was, you know, super specific and clear. And, um, and then we started, you know, as the week progressed, we started, um, you know, putting things together in various, um, mm -hmm. you know, she organized them in, in certain ways and we would reorganize them. And then she started making a little bit more on the four of us that were there. Um, but, uh, but it was, a, it was an incredible, <laughs> incredible week. Like she's, you know, I think what, She's so, she understands her style so well and is so able and so clear about explaining it to her dancers and really sort of nurtures you and gathers you and, and sort of leads you to this, you know, beautiful vision of her ballet with, you know, kindness and respect. And she's incredible, incredible. And, um, but working with her, especially that week, I, I, I found so interesting is that I really, I really enjoyed how specific she was and how each day the details kept getting more and more, oh. um, like, like it just, the details kept building and, and yeah, she, she never kept, really went back on anything. She never I mean, really she went back. Read, she would, she, she would cut and paste the different phrases, but she yeah. never changed her mind about the phrases. No, she no. And that's, that was just so, yeah. elaborated more on it. Yeah. She really oh, wow. like, as soon as yeah. she knew something worked, like she kind of was able to get each day, get clearer and clearer with us about what she wanted. Yeah. And I found that to be really thrilling um, to work with that level of specificity and going back to the idea of intention, you know, for me, I found that really freeing in a way how specific she was because I knew very exactly what I was aiming for. You know, I, I knew what the idea it was really like her ideas about what she wanted the ballet to look like, how she wanted the steps done was so clear and, and really, um, yeah, she art was able to articulate it in such a, yeah, a, a, I think her, yeah. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe she danced, um, under with Forsyth at a certain point yeah. in her career too, right? Did, so I'm yeah. sure she, she definitely took some tools, from his yeah. um, is his tool bag and, and applies it to her own sense of movement. What, like you said, her she has such a clear idea of her own mm. sense of movement um, that just translates so clearly onto what she produced for us. I mean, it was so incredible. I mean, this have uh, have you guys had the chance to perform that yet? I or was it yeah. or was it uh, postponed? We performed it at the very beginning of March, so kind of before this all. Okay, it happened. But, yeah. Uh, oh, so it lucky, was, so lucky. It was. That's great. Yeah, we were yeah, really fortunate we were, to be able to yeah, do that. It was. It was a, an incredible process, and she's like the queen. A lot is demanded of us in terms of versatility now in ballet companies because you know we're both in ballet professional ballet companies and doing this very very abstract contemporary modern work, and then we do also the classically driven. Uh, narrative work, um, I think it creates a much more aware dancer um, and that kind of ability and capability of, of, of moving and shaping our bodies, but it, but it can be difficult. I mean, you, I, guess, I guess my question is like how important is it to be versatile, not, not in the sense of um, like tap jazz modern but you know versatile in the sense of I guess being open I mean I think it's crucial I think you know being open is what makes this so such an interesting and fulfilling career like I think yeah I think being open to new experiences is always good and uh, yeah. I think it really teaches you things that you didn't really, maybe didn't even consider. And just thinking about my yeah. own experience, some of the most amazing um, experiences that I've had were ones that I really didn't 
think much of beforehand or didn't really Mm -hmm. know what I was getting into or didn't really think that it was gonna you know this style was gonna suit me or I could do this or but I really you know those experiences I think opened me up maybe even more so than the ones where I felt more comfortable and felt more myself. Mm. Interesting. What do you think, Patrick? Yeah, of course. I, I, I agree 100%. Uh, because you are, especially if you work uh, in a major ballet company, and I, to my experience, I've only ever worked in America. So mm-hmm. to work for an American company that is, is, most of them are very broad in what they produce. Right. The, you have to, uh, you're, conf- you're confronted with your prejudices about dance. Mm-hmm. You're often asked to, to um, grow past them and yeah. to give everything a chance, give everything a chance. Because uh, first of all, it's the only way you're going to really get any opportunities, I think. Nobody really wants to be in the room with somebody that they have to convince. Yeah. They have to, um, you, they're looking for people that are eager, people that are, um open-minded yeah i think definitely i think versatility versatility is kind of the whole game because, yeah uh even even in classical ballet if you're asked to dance uh for instance a, a nuriev ballet versus an ashton you'll find yeah, yeah. so much you, difference that's, between that's those two demands versatility <laughs> even though they're both classically Absolutely. driven and rooted yeah in yeah that. yeah it's true do you think there are any common like misconceptions about ballet dancers today oh there's so many (laughs) (laughs) oh i that black swan yeah it's it black swan there's a lot of everybody jumps to the eating disorder question Mm -hmm. everybody jumps to the psychotic ballerina to the actually you know what you know what surprises me most is when people think that this is uh not our only job that, that yeah. people think Love that this that is one. kind of more of a, yeah, more of, an, <laughs> a, of, of a life consuming and, <laughs> and a completely engrossing hobby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, but, but there, I think, I think there are, I think there are good stereotypes about dancers too. Yeah. too. I think there's, you know, the, the, usually the work ethic is, is, is recognized. I think the, the shortness of the career is recognized. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I, I think definitely there's so many misconceptions about ballet dancers, but I think as you said, you know, there's lots of, um, like, you know, people associate lots of good things with dancers as well. And I think one of the benefits of social media is that, you know, people have gotten to see what our world is like more than they have in the past. And they've gotten more firsthand experience to some of the things we go through and, how hard we work and what our days are like. And, and I think that hopefully has opened up people's eyes a little bit to yeah. what we do and mm-hmm. how seriously we take it. You know, I think that's, I think that's the hardest thing for me when I talk to people about being a dancer is that I, I feel like no matter what I say, it doesn't come across that this is, you know, this is my passion. I'm super serious about this. This is what I love to do. As you were saying, it, 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 sometimes they think it's like, oh, a hobby, you know, a cute thing you do after after you know you've done everything else I'm like no like sure. I, nights and weekends <laughs> yeah yeah exactly like no no this is what I've dedicated my life to if you guys could give advice to younger dancers what have you discovered in our industry that you would want them to know uh, I think one, one of the hardened truths I think uh, I see with a lot of people is is how lucky you have to be and how much luck can play into what ends up happening from year to year. Mm. Uh, again, I'll speak as an American because I love the way the Canadian system works. I absolutely love how well your arts are funded and how I, I, I look at Germany, which just threw 50 billion euros in the middle of an yes, international pandemic mm-hmm. behind their arts institutions. And, and there's so much passion to to preserve, preserve and yeah. to continue, yeah, preservation of the work. And where was I going with this? Um, it, and in America, that, that is not the case at all. And 
uh, in my instance, I remember joining Boston Ballet School around the time of the financial crash. Mm. And it was a very mm. specific story, but it's, you know, the company had shrunk su substantially. It's, mm -hmm. it's nearly twice, as, twice the size, dancer-wise, as when I first joined. And I was intensely lucky. I was in incredibly lucky to join when I did because that got me the chance to be in the room with the company because they just needed bodies. They needed more people, no matter, and they had to reach into the school for, for that resource. Uh, so, so in the system that I was in, I was, I was just extraordinarily lucky. So I would say um, to young dancers, you know, be willing to cast a broad net so that you find yourself in the right place at the right at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like this time, the time that we're living in currently is one of the most, it's already difficult. And now yeah. um, uh, during this crisis, it's, it's probably seemed impossible for some young dancers wanting to get jobs in companies. Yeah. Because yeah. You know, how, yeah, how, are they gonna, how are they going to show up? How are they going to audition? I mean, yeah. it's going to be, it's going to be tough. So I'm, I'm really curious to see where our industry, how our industry pivots after this and, and what repercussions we're going to have to face um, post COVID. But I don't want to get into the crisis so much. I, yeah. I, I love, I love what you guys have been saying about creativity and choreography and, was there any uh, aspiring information that you want to give young listeners or younger dancers who want to make this their career? Um, I think, I mean, I, it's, 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 it's an interesting question for me because I feel like I'm still kind of learning so much, you know, and still kind of, I think you never, yeah, really stop learning. And I think a lot of times, at least for me, you know, when I was younger, I felt like I needed to be like, before I could get into a company, I needed to make a certain level, you know, I needed to be able to do, like, I needed to make it sort of like, I needed to be good enough, I needed to be, you know, enough, essentially, but I feel like you kind of like what you said, Patrick, at the beginning of the conversation is that you never really know that you're ready until it's over a little bit. So I feel like, like, you know, like, be, as we were saying, be open to continuing the process of learning and to be open to, um, to new experiences and, and things you would not necessarily have considered and to trust in hard work, like really trust in hard work because when, you know, those opportunities do arise, the work that you've put in is going to get you there and um, yeah yeah i completely agree yeah. so mm -hmm. yeah with with where you're at now my final question for the two of you is what has dancing done to change your lives i mean i don't know my life without dance so i i feel um yeah, like I, I don't really, I don't really know what it's done to change my life because it's always been a part of my life, and I feel like right. being a dancer really just it brings me closer to to who I who, who I want to be. So, Patrick, yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful sentiment. I would say that it's it's the the highest highs and the lowest lows. It's a challenging. Uh, it's it's showbiz showbiz can suck sometimes but it is also mm -hmm. the greatest thing you'll ever do <laughs> yeah it's yeah it's so rewarding and and, and all so the good expensive. moments yeah those good moments yeah. make it worth everything yeah I, I i i totally agree with that i whenever i'm you know in a rut or super down on myself it's i always go back to that first moment that I can remember of, you know, walking into the building where, you know, um, the National Ballet, for example, and my, my, my first company class and that feeling that you had in the studio of like utter joy and excitement and to not forget those moments yeah. as, we, as we age within this career um, because they seem so distant, but to remember those feelings I think are what keep me um, driven and inspired. Thank you both so much for taking Thank the time. Thank you. 
with me today. Um, you're such lovely um, speakers and have really, really opened my eyes to a lot of, a lot of different um, possibilities that I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna apply now. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. Oh, Thanks for having me. Um, thank you. Yeah. Take care. Thanks so much. Bye. This art form continues to evolve with dancers, always striving to develop their technique and artistry. But I also believe it has to do with the choreographers of our time, right now in the world of dance, requiring our ability to be so broad. The diversity and sheer physical demand and openness, as Spencer mentioned, that's required of dancers in this day and age is something that I think will continue to push our art to places we've yet to discover. I love that feeling right before the opening of any performance, whether it be before a new creation or a piece that we've already performed that's in our repertoire. And it's when the choreographer is there with us on stage, all the dancers are there before the curtain goes up and he or she says, now it's yours. I think this statement is so powerful, humbling and uplifting all at the same time. It really sets the tone and I believe is truly how you tap in to the artist's ability and then let the work live on through them. So now I want to be super candid with all of you and share that last week I hit a wall in terms of my mental stamina, my physical stamina, Doing ballet in the confines of my dining and living room really started to take a toll on me. I was craving the studio, and I'm sure most dancers can empathize with this, and really missing that peer-to-peer -peer interaction and communal environment that we all know and love. So I wanted to take this as a moment to thank each and every one of you out there listening. It really means a lot because this journey for me is very new, but I'm having a lot of fun with it, continuing to learn from these artists by sharing different thoughts and ideas and developing new ways at looking at this art form within ourselves and one another.